Welcome to Everything Co-op, bringing you information on how cooperatives can help improve your quality of life. This show is being sponsored by the National Co-op Bank, NCB. The NCB is dedicated to strengthening communities nationwide for the delivery of banking and financial services for the nation's cooperatives, their members, and other socially responsible organizations. For more information on the power of community ownership, visit ncb.coop. That's ncb.coop. Now stay tuned for your host, Vernon Oaks. Good morning. This is Vernon Oaks, and the program is Everything Co-op. Welcome. It's a beautiful day here in Washington, D.C., and we have Miss Minnie McMahon as our guest today. Uh, good morning, Minnie. Good morning, Vernon. And where are you today? I am in Dorchester, Massachusetts, which is a part of Boston. Oh, so you're further up north. Okay. All right. So we're going to talk about something called community land trust today. Can we start off by you telling us what is a community land trust? Absolutely. And thank you so much, first of all, for having me on the show today. So community land trusts are community governed organizations. They're nonprofits with a community led board of directors that hold land on behalf of a community. So community land trusts will acquire land, they'll buy it or it will be donated to them and take it off the market. And then they will lease the land at affordable rates for any use that is that is aligned with its mission. So you might have owned homes on community land trust land, rental homes, commercial spaces, farms, gardens, open space, and um, cultural spaces as well. So the community land trust somehow gets control over land and they hold the land for the benefit of the community. That's right. As opposed to the benefit of a capitalist, and I've been one of those, by the way. I hold, I've held some land that I've owned to make money off of, and that's what mostly land is. I would think is held for in the U.S. People would buy land so they can make money off of that land. This isn't to make money off of it. That's right. This is the work of community land trusts is really about permanent affordability decommodifying land, decommodifying housing. And really, I don't know if your listeners are have heard the sort of this distinction between the use value of land, of housing, and the exchange value, right? The ways we, we think about how we can profit from land and housing. Community land trusts were really about how is our how are our spaces used best used for the benefit of, you know, to create and, and maintain thriving neighborhoods. So the sort of the profit motive that is so typical in our society is not what's upheld on community land trusts. It's, it's about having thriving, stable communities permanently. So CLTs will um, acquire land and they'll permanently keep it off the market and then lease it out for affordable uses. And in the case of home ownership on the, on the land trust, an, an individual, a family can buy a home and they'll um, they'll pay like a 40, well, it depends on the CLT, but they'll pay a monthly rent to the CLT, a nominal amount. And they will agree to when it's time for them to sell the home, to sell it at um, a designated price that will keep the home affordable for the next generation. So it's a shared equity uh, housing model in the case of um, home ownership. Shared equity, you're sharing the equity with future generations. That's uh, right. You, you don't make the problem. Well, I went back and got my MBA so I could make money, and I, I've done that in real estate. Uh, so I think I own four condos, two apartment buildings, and one house. And it was all about how do you rent those out to make money or how do you hold on to them and then sell them to make money. That's the for-profit motive, and I have been a capitalist uh, most of my 75 years on this earth, but I really like the co-op model. That's why we have this program, and I wanted to know more about this community land trust because that's a whole 
different reason for buying land. Now, how does the community land trust, you said it is a nonprofit, there's a board of directors that controls this this uh, nonprofit, okay, and it controls it for the benefit of the community, not a particular individual or individuals that own the land. How do you get land? How do you, how do you, do you, I don't know, do people donate money and you buy land and what, how do you get the land? Yeah, this is, this is it's a lot different ways, different ways. So we're seeing in some cities across the country, we're seeing a huge um, sort of wave of support for community land trusts in the last, I don't know, 15, 10, 15 years. And in some cities, um, the cities themselves are really supportive and they're doing land banking. So they might take tax foreclosed on properties and um, hold them and then transfer those properties to a community land trust at at little or no cost. Hold on a second. I just want to make sure I understand this. So Washington, D.C. or Boston Uh, a city will get some land in some kind of way more often than not somebody having paid their taxes and so they end up owning the land and then the city can say to the community land trust here's this piece of property we will give you title to that property as long as you make it permanently affordable that's correct. Yeah. And it, and it depends on the city so that we don't have land banking here in Boston. I don't know if you do in D.C. Atlanta, I believe, does um, does land banking in Boston. The way that it works for some of our community land trusts is that, you know, the city owns land and they'll they'll um, they're ready to dispose of it. They want to get it off their books and have it be developed and used. And so um, a CLT, a community land trust, can apply, you know, they can put in a bid for that land. And in one of our neighborhoods, one of the CLTs has a, you know, actually has a preference, has sort of a, 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 is at the front of the line for some of those properties. So that's a policy choice. In some cases that, you know, and now here we're talking about public land. Some of our community land trusts are actually just, On the market, they're going out and they're competing with cash buyers in a hot market like Boston, and they're actually scrambling together to put offers down to buy land and the existing housing on that land. So CLTs can acquire vacant land or they can acquire land with structures on it. And in our context today, oftentimes that looks like CLTs trying to buy existing, um, typically rental properties to get it off the market, prevent speculation and the flipping of the homes, and then the ensuing displacement of of the families, which is, of course, a major problem in so many cities and towns across the country is this gentrification and displacement. Well, we definitely see it here in D.C., Yeah. Um, but L.A., Chicago, everywhere, large cities are gentrifying and People that don't make the money normally can't make the money to afford the housing, so they've got to go somewhere else. Okay, so then to help people stay in the communities, a community land trust is formed to get control over the property and take it off the speculative market so people like me won't come in and buy it and raise those prices, the rental prices and the selling prices. Okay. You got it, yeah. Okay. And I should mention, Vernon, if I if I may, that this is the context we're in today, right? Where land values are skyrocketing, housing values are skyrocketing. This model also has its merits when there's a downturn, when there are market downturns. So during the foreclosure crisis, there were far fewer foreclosures Wait, on this 2007 2008 time frame. Yes, you're talking? yes, okay. yes. Far fewer foreclosures on CLT in, in home ownership on community land trusts because the value of the home and the land is not dependent on the market. It stays stable. So it can't skyrocket and you can't profit greatly from having a CLT home, nor are you likely to lose your home to some big market crash. So it's really a stabilizing it's sort of a long-term vision for stabilizing housing stock and communities irrespective of the market. So that particular 
yo-yo effect doesn't happen in community land trust housing, but it also doesn't uh, happen in a in a co-ops, um, limited equity housing co-ops, because they have the same kind of a deal. We keep the prices low, so when the market goes up, it doesn't go up, and so when you have the crashes, people can still afford their homes and stay in them. So you also don't get as many foreclosures uh, or people having to move out. So yeah, it, it works. Good news. Now, how did you get into this work? What, what's your education background or where did you grow up? Yeah, so I grew up in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which is just right. Oh, you're right. home. You're home. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I grew up right across the river from Boston. But they are separate places. But, yeah, I, I grew up in a house with lots of siblings, and, and we always we always had open doors and people over. And I think that just has impacted me from a young age, sense of community and abundance. And I, I ended up mostly farming, actually, when I was graduated from college and I was working on small farms I was interested in food systems and labor and migration and just generally speaking power land who's controlling resources um, and it that those sort of those informal education about working on farms and then reading things eventually led me to graduate school to study urban planning and, and public policy uh, which I did at Tufts University which is very close to my hometown of Cambridge. And through that education, studying um, urban and environmental policy and planning, I was introduced to Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative, which is my current employer, which is the mother organization that, that founded Dudley Neighbors Incorporated, which is one of the oldest urban community land trusts in, in the nation. So Dudley Street is one of the oldest community land trusts? That's right, yeah. DSNI is a community organizing group that did a number of um, anti-urban renewal campaigns and, and um, community planning initiatives that really was by the people for the people back in the 1980s, which uh, eventually resulted in actually being able to own about 30 acres of urban land here in Dorchester and Roxbury, which are historically, traditionally, and today mostly black neighborhoods and, and immigrant neighborhoods. And so DNI, Dudley Neighbors Incorporated, is the CLT that was founded by this larger organizing um, and community planning organization. Okay, so that's a great place to stop to take our first break. We're talking to Minnie McMahon, and we're talking about community land trust. We just started talking about Dudley Street in Roxborough, Massachusetts, and we were, when we get back, we're going to talk more about Roxbury. And you said it was mainly black neighborhood and how this Dudley Street land trust happened and evolved. And eventually we'll talk about these 30, 32 acres of land that they own and what's on those land. We'll be right back. Please don't touch that down. News Talk 1450 WOLAM where information is power. Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks, and the program is Everything Cooperative. Uh, we have Miss Minnie on with us today. We're talking about community land trusts and how they operate, what they are, and how they operate. And right before the break, you had mentioned Dudley Street. Can you go back and tell us what Dudley Street is? Sure, yes. So Dudley Street itself is a kind of a one major thoroughfare in Roxbury, which is sort of the, it's a, it's a large neighborhood in Boston, which is um, a predominantly black neighborhood that has been for many generations. And along Dudley Street in the 1980s, a community came together to basically protest and organize against a tremendous amount of disinvestment that was happening in the neighborhood. There were a lot of vacant parcels lots of trash, illegal dumping, there were illegal transfer stations. And this, of course, was happening in black urban communities across the country due to the legacy of redlining, due to urban renewal policies. And the community came together. They saw that the city had raised other parts of the city, the West End, which was another historically black neighborhood, 
And the folks at Dudley Street were concerned that the city's going to come in here and they're going to try to plan for our neighborhood and they're going to kick us out. So the community organized across multiple languages at, at that time, um, Spanish, English, Cape Verde, and Creole were the predominant languages. People came together, they picked up trash, they closed the illegal transfer stations, and then after having gained some wins in, in this campaign um, called Don't Dump on Us, which was closing the transfer stations, actually started a campaign to own the land. So to, to, to take this vacant land that was some of it owned by the city, some of it owned by absentee landlords, to say, wait a minute, can we actually own this land? And that will help us implement a long-term community plan uh, that they that they were also working on at that time. So out of those organizing efforts at Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative, this community land trust called Dudley Neighbors Incorporated was formed to actually be the legal entity that held that land and could then partner with developers to 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 build the structures and and hold that land um, for long term community use. So it's kind of like a you know a, a baby organization embedded in a in a mama organization, and we see that a lot with community land trusts really coming out of grassroots organizing and then being this legal model that can um, sustain some of the physical development work. So Dudley Neighbors Incorporated is the baby model, and what's the larger umbrella in the organization? Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative. Yeah. Oh. Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative, and that's the when you say DSNI, that's what you're talking about. Dudley that's Street right. Neighborhood yeah, Initiative. sorry about the okay. acronyms. <laughs> okay, okay. So while you were talking, I wanted to know what's the percentage of blacks in Boston. And one report says that there were, in 2020 there was 485,000 blacks in Boston. And it had doubled since 1980. In 1980, it was 5.5 percent of the population was black in Boston. In 2020, it was 10.6 percent. At least that's from Google. I don't know how true it is, but just googling and asking the question, that's what I came up with. And and Dudley Street is a black neighborhood, or, or main thoroughfare, you said, which is mainly blacks, and. It was going downhill, and the neighbors said, oh, no, we're not going to let this happen. We're going to come in and take over, and they end up with 30 acres of land and control over that land. That's right, yeah. Okay, and that's your boss now? You work for Dudley Street? Yes, that's right. Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative is is the, the host, the convening organization of actually a network of community land trusts within Greater Boston, so my role is to is to coordinate that ne- network of community land trusts and try to advance um, policy initiatives, education, helping support emerging community land trusts across the city and across the region. And um, Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative, having been this organization that was tremendously successful in fighting against urban renewal um, policies and actually being able to gain ownership of the land has been looked to by a lot of organizations. So around 2015, um, informal network came to be to try to support emerging community community land trusts around the city. And my work is to, to coordinate that space and, just, and steward it and, and keep our collective projects uh, moving forward. So what's the mission of DSNI, Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative? Our mission is to, I'm not going to get, I can't give it you word for word, but it's mm-hmm. um, its to empower Dudley residents, the neighbor, uh, neighborhood residents, to plan for and, and fight for um, and achieve a, a, thriving, a thriving urban village, basically. And, and DSNI has a very beautiful list of community rights that include a right, you know, right to quality education, right to good childcare, right to meaningful economic opportunity, right to um, a full spiritual life, and those sorts of explorations. So, while a big part of Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiatives' work is 
the planning work and the community land trust work. It's also the more sort of holistic community organization that's really about well-being on many levels within within our local geography. So one of the interesting things that I learned on this radio show was what causes poor health and not have good housing is at the top of the list. Yeah, okay. that's right. Yeah. Uh, when you look at black neighborhoods and I'm, I'm not sure what it's like in Boston, um, but I've had some stats like in Cleveland, if you look in the black neighborhood of Cleveland and you go to the white suburbs, the blacks have at least 10 years less life expectancy than the whites do in, in, in the suburbs. A lot of that has to do with housing and wealth and all of the rights that you just talked about. The Dudley Street folks said that they, they do you have a right to in our neighborhood. Okay. And I saw about a year ago, like an overlay of, of lifespan uh, maps overlaid on old redlining maps on where banks did and did not offer mortgages and would and would not lend. And those mortality outcomes really map onto the old redlining maps, which, you know, it, it isn't shocking because I think a lot of us understand these things now, but it's, 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 it's atrocious. And we are seeing more, I think, you know, hospital, we're hearing more about the social determinants of health and seeing more institutional players like hospitals getting involved in housing and, and really like, oh, we need to, we need to stabilize neighborhoods. So I just want to make sure I understood what you just said. In those redlining districts, okay, where banks would not loan money, mainly to black folk, when you look at the life expectancy you could see that the life expectancy in those red line districts was a lot less than the other areas. That's poor, correct. Poor health outcomes, poor live less life and less quality of life. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's my understanding. Yep. And I wish I can't I can't tell you right now which cities, but there was a there was actually a conference in D.C. last year. And there is a whole array of maps in, in sort of ur- several urban cores across the country that was that was showing this. Yeah. With w- what I've done and understand that that fits. I haven't seen that map. I would like to see that overlay, particularly for, you know, all cities in the U.S. or all areas in the U.S. And mainly I'm thinking urban, but it could also lay out in rural areas also. That right. You'd see those same poor health outcomes and poor life expectancies. And it's sad. Um, It's very sad. So the work you're doing, though, is to overcome all of that. That's what we're working on. Yes, yes. (laughs) Alongside many partners and with many other, you know, types of attempts and models and ways of, you know, practicing alternatives to this, these sorts of uh, mainstream ways of thinking in American culture. Yeah, yeah. It can't be CLTs alone, but we are a part of it, we think. It can't be community land trusts alone, I agree, but it can be a big part of it. Okay, we're going to take our second break. And um, many, I really like what you're teaching me and uh, folks on, on the uh, radio show here today. But I, uh, I want to come back and talk about the different CLTs in Boston. We got the Dudley Street, but what's the di- all of the network? We'll be right back. Please don't touch that down. <laughs> News Talk 1450 WOL AM, where information is power. Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks, and the program is Everything Co op. And you know, um, Many, we've been on the show as of October, it would be 10 years uh, wow. that, that we've been doing this show, and we have exciting guests like you on. Uh, but I'm going to give a shout out to National Cooperative Bank. Um, they've been our financial supporter for this whole 10 years, and uh, more importantly, they've been a great partner. Uh, we cooperate together, and they give us ideas of 
people out that are doing things in the co-op space. Uh, NCB's mission is to support and be an advocate for America's cooperatives and their members, especially in low-income communities, by providing innovative financial and related services. So it, they also work with member-owned organizations to help communities thrive, and that's where I can see them working with community land trusts. Do you all have any co-op housing on your properties, on your land trust properties? So within the Greater Boston Community Land Trust Network, there are seven community land trusts most of which do housing in addition to other uses on the land, and one of which is a farming, uh, just a farms community land trust, which we can talk about if we have time. But on one of our community land trusts, we have had a renter's co-op. Two of the developments on that community land trust were established as renter's co-ops with the idea that while the renters would not be building any equity, they would have governance power over policies, building policies, rent policies, who's managing the building, and that they'd be building community among them. Um, Unfortunately, those co-ops were, there was good intention and good attempts in the beginning to really create a robust governance body among the tenants, but that didn't actually take off. But there are examples of resident co-ops in Burlington, Vermont, in the Champlain Housing Trust in Burlington, Vermont is one, and and in elsewhere, other CLTs across across the country. And we are, within our local community land trust in Boston, looking at establishing renter co-ops and also rent-to-own programs. Yeah, because when I I have this community land trust with the community land trust owning the land and then when they rent out they rent out the building if you will and not the land so you get a a less rental amount but if you could put a co-op on there you get permanent um, affordability long-term permanent affordability where when you just have a co-op like in DC most of the co-ops that were created some of them 50 years ago Um, after the leases, after the um, mortgage is up, they don't have to remain affordable. And some of those co-ops decided to sell to developers or become um, a condo, and then the co-op members would make that money. So they would cash in on the increase in value as opposed to this shared equity you talked about where the the person that lived there today then to share that equity to somebody in the future. And some some co-ops decided to do that here in the district. And, and we have a, almost a 100 limited equity housing co-ops in the district. And, again, some of them are around 40, 50, 60 years, and they decided to stay affordable. But if they were under a land trust, then it would be permanent affordability. Exactly. Uh, that's right. Yeah like that model. Okay, so tell me about, tell us about these seven different community land trusts in Boston and the network, Uh, something about some of them. Who are they and what do they do? Sure, so I can highlight uh, a few. Uh, One I'll mention is Chinatown Community Land Trust. They, of course, operate in Boston's Chinatown. They've been around about five years, give or take, maybe a little longer. And they, like many other community land trusts, were sort of were born of a local organizing group called Chinese Progressive Association, which is a, lo- a long time organizing body in Boston's Chinatown. Chinatown CLT's focus is really on preserving Chinatown's historic row houses. So they do a lot of, they, they operate only in acquisition of existing properties, land with buildings on them, to then convert those row houses into permanent affordability because we're seeing tons of gentrification in Chinatown. The land and housing costs are extremely high. There was a big Airbnb problem in Chinatown and across the city, but in Chinatown a few years ago, and then policy was actually able to stem that. But Chinatown's really focused on preserving historic row houses as well as uh, cultural planning and um, preserving 
open space too, that of, of cultural relevance. And um, another CLT community land trust I'll mention is Comunidades Enraizadas, which is rooted communities. They're in Chelsea, Massachusetts, which is right across the river from us. And they're founded by a group of predominantly women from Honduras. They, they grew up in a much more cooperative culture with the different politics around land and housing. And the city they live in, Chelsea, is about one square mile. It's a hugely dense place of largely immigrant and low-income populations. And they have formed a community land trust, and they um, have just put a bid in, a proposal in, to, to purchase and then develop in partnership with Habitat their first residential units. So we're all uh, supporting them from, from the sidelines as they go ahead with their first development. So on them... Oh, sure. On them... Um, so a group of women from Honduras who live in Chelsea are trying to figure out how they can get and keep affordable housing. And so they they have partnered with Habitat for Humanity. And then the other community land trusts are supporting them? Are you, are you giving them training on how to create community land trusts, how to operate community land trusts? Or are you cheerleading for them what how the other land trusts support these ladies yeah sure yeah what does that look like so well they so comunidades and rizadas the the community land trust it it came out of its own mother organization called chelsea green roots which is a an environmental justice organization and um so that organization was able to um, support the coming to be of of this community land trust the way that the network, the other community land trusts support one another is through a lot of peer learning. We meet monthly, we talk about shared issues, we ask each other questions. Hey, how did you come up with your um, limited equity formula? How do you deal with this tax issue? Do you know a good accountant, right? What kind of policies are you running up against that um, maybe we can together t- try to change? So. From the very sort of technical questions about starting an organization and what sorts of policies and bylaws to bigger picture around like the ecosystem in which we're operating, the financial ecosystem, the political ecosystem, trying to work together to um, make policy changes to uh, support our collective work. So do you find that these ladies from Honduras, are they highly educated do they have doctorate degrees or bachelor's degrees or master's degrees what do you what do you find in terms of their formal education well i'll tell you this i don't know for these particular individuals much about their personal backgrounds or or levels of education but speaking generally um we see in many neighborhoods across Boston and then also towns in the sort of greater Boston area, cities and towns, most of the people, many, many of the people who have, have to be on the move, who are in search of stable housing, who are getting displaced because of a lack of stable housing and because of a lack of economic opportunity are, are yeah, work, working class people or poor people, typically not highly educated people Right. These are our people. These are our communities who are getting pushed around and certainly, certainly fighting back. But we do see a lot of interest in establishing community land trusts among this very, you know, it's a very large umbrella. But these com- communities of color, um, oftentimes immigrant who do not have access to, to the resources that, you know, highly educated, uh, wealthy, white, white America is much more accustomed to. So what I found out when I was managing a limited equity housing co-ops, it was mainly black women that were in charge of these communities that, at these boards. And most at best would have a high school degree. But with the training that you were talking about, the peer training, the formal training that they would go to and, and get, they would make extremely good decisions. And it was interesting. They held each other accountable. 
and held the professionals, whether they were lawyers or accountants or management companies, which is what I was, mm -hmm. uh, would, would hold us accountable to, to make sure that things were accomplished, got done and were accomplished. I also found that there was less problems with police and crime because people took interest in their communities. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's why I asked the question when you talk about these women and the education, is that, that more often than not, you don't need a formal education to make great CEOs of businesses when you can get this yeah. training that you're talking about and they're the, the, the heart is in the, in the deal. They really want this work, they need it. Right, and I think, you know, it's, it's easy to say, oh, in mainstream America, this and that, which it, it, it's true that, housing is commodified and and there are many you know major issues of sort of what what we have we have a joint sense probably of what sort of white mainstream power structure looks like that's very real we're all operating under that and at the same time so many people so many communities are just every day practicing looking out for one another raising children collaboratively sharing money sharing resources whether you come from another country where that was that's just how it's done or whether you come from you know centuries of tradition within your own communities where you look out for each other so i think what we're sort of trying to practice at the community land trust it's not new right it's 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 not new to be doing experiments and practices in more collective economics and in, in, in co-governance. And there are many historical precedents for this this kind of work. And it's it's sort of, it's happening all, all around us. There, there are words for it, fancy words like solidarity economy or just transition work. Um, and for many people, it's just familiar looking, you know, looking out for each other. It takes a village to raise a child. What I hear you talking about, it takes a village that we're working together. And, and if you go back and you look at tribes and villages, everybody had a job to do. And if you didn't get your job done, then the village hurt. So people relied on each other. And that's what you're talking about with community land trusts or cooperative multifamily housing or cooperative um, employees, worker employees ownership companies listen we'll be right back we're going to take our final break i want to come back and get a few more of the community land trust and also talk about where you see the future for community land trust in the u.s we'll be right back please don't touch that dial news talk 1450 wol am where information is power Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks, and I have Minnie McMahon on with us today. We're talking about community land trust, and we were talking about the, the network of, of community land trust. Could you tell us about the Boston Farm Community Land Trust? What's Certainly. That? Yeah, so Boston Farms Community Land Trust also recently established across several neighborhoods in Boston. They were also incubated by um, sort of a mother organization called the Urban Farming Institute. And at Boston Farms Community Land Trust, what they do is acquire land and they will turn that land into farm sites. And the Community Land Trust itself is a nonprofit, but part of their mission is to, it's to create farm sites and it's also to support the development of small farmers of, of small farm businesses, micro um, enterprises uh, within within Boston. So do you know what the first community land trust was in the U.S.? Yes, the first community land trust was in large part, you know, an agricultural project, but not solely. This is uh, new communities in um, southwest Georgia and Albany, Georgia. They were a project that was established, I think, around 1969, right during the civil rights movement. This was a group of African American individuals, couples, families. Uh, Charles Sherrod and Shirley Sherrod were the, the leaders of that, as far as we understand, who bought a lot of land together in Southwest Georgia to farm it, to build schools, to build homes, and to really 
have a self-determined community. And so all of these CLTs, community land trusts we're talking about today, and we're seeing a huge proliferation across the country, are really operating in their in their legacy. And today, you know, it's it's the organization has really changed shape. They have a very interesting history that includes lots of struggle, even after establishing the community land trust, lots of racist struggle from their neighbors, from the state agricultural commission, issues around um, agricultural lending that they did not have access to, but I encourage folks to look them up. And today they still exist as a many acre pecan farm that I understand you've been to, Vernon, as have, so, as have I. I, um, I. I wanted to get that in because Shirley and Charles are two of my heroes. And I did visit them. They had gotten up to 5,000 acres before they had difficulty and could not get the kinds of loans that the white farmers were getting, and then they lost that. Um, they now have about 1,400-acre farm that was in a plantation, and they had pecans and grapes, and they were getting ready to put a vegetable, and they, they have a pond on it. I went fishing there. A great place. And they have a – talking about um, bed and breakfast things, they have a few um, places you can go stay. Did you catch any fish? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) And and cleaned them and cooked them and ate them. Yeah, it was good stuff. (laughs) And so, well, first, they went to Israel to learn about community land trust, and they came back and they implemented it in the civil rights movement. And it's taken off now. So can you talk about some of the other community land trusts around the U.S., what's going on? Sure. Yeah. So, so we are in touch in, in greater Boston, our network, we're, we're small, but mighty. And we are in touch with other networks across the country. The California CLT network is quite robust. They have many community land trusts across the state. Um, and same as in New York city and New York state and Toronto, we are just on a call together with the, uh, excuse me, not Toronto, the, the Canada CLT network, uh, representative, and Baltimore, uh, Maryland has a strong network called the Share Network that's recently established. So there are lots of networks. And I guess I'll point out, you know, just to a little more color on the sort of different uses of land on community land trusts. Um, in Boston, we have rentals, we have a home ownership, we have some businesses on our community land trusts. We have a small flower shop in, in one of Dudley Neighbors Incorporated's properties. Um, and Dudley Neighbors Incorporated has been able to house five or six um, nonprofit or small businesses in one of our commercial buildings. In Oakland, California, the Oakland CLT partnered with a worker co-op called Asta Muerte Coffee, who was at risk of getting evicted. And Asta Muerte took their right of first refusal, which they happened to, they had the foresight to, to get that into their lease. And they gave that right of first refusal when the building was up for sale to Oakland CLT. And together, um, the CLT and Asta Muerte Coffee were able to get control of the building. So that's a worker co-op. Mm. There are other community land trusts that have some not like sort of community space, nonprofit space, in Anchorage, Alaska, in Champlain, um, in Burlington, Vermont. So there are many, many examples. um, And commercial's tough, you know, that's another topic. But um, commercial's tough, and we're seeing a lot of attempts to not just stabilize housing, but to provide good opportunities for um, economic stability and economic development. Okay, so... It's also interesting to me, you are a white lady working in a black community trying to help folks from Honduras and all over. Um, Where did you get your calling from or your passion to do this work? Well, I would say that I mentioned that I grew up in a house with a lot of people. I think just this ethos of there was sort of an open door policy within my house. And I came from a family of abundance, you know, stably housed, a family with wealth. And 
for whatever reasons, maybe, maybe my parents, the education from my parents that they gave to me, I was always curious about who had things and who didn't have things and what types of things and, you know, why, why, uh, why are these kids hanging out together and those kids not hanging out? I just have always felt sort of tapped into social dynamics and curiosity around that as a little kid. So I, I just sort of think of that, I don't know, as maybe sort of a, just interested in power dynamics from very early on. Well, you mentioned three times now power. You use that word three times in this interview. So wh what do you see in terms of power when you say power dynamics in looking at different communities or different groups of people to see who has power, who doesn't have power? What, what, what are you looking at around power? Yeah. Well, I think that, so we, we, we have to not just think of power as a bad thing, right? There's also people power, community power, um, you know, the sort of the, the skills, the heart, the, the collective work that we can do together as people, irrespective of how much money we have or education. So there's that kind of power. How do we foster community power and use it wisely? Mm -hmm. And then there's, yeah, and then it's looking at, okay, well, what are the institutions? What are the processes at which these decisions about, you know, what money gets lent and what building gets built and what's, you know, is, is the developer of a luxury condo, are their interests um, put above those of the larger community? Um, questions about, yeah, who controls those types of resources? And... You know, Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative, my employer, it's always been a very multicultural, multiracial, uh, multi-ethnic organization since its inception. And that's still true today. And I think everybody, everybody has a, has a role to play in, you know, bringing our passions and our skills and our interests in fights for more, a more just world system economy. And we see lots of, um, I think a problem that we do have in Boston and elsewhere, but certainly in Boston, we have lots of nonprofits, which on its own isn't a problem, but we do have a lot of, you know, we really value over, I think overvalue education within the nonprofit system, like having, you know, you need high credentials to get a job. And there's definitely a lot of whiteness within our nonprofits in Boston that, I think it looks different in, in other parts of the country where you see more people of color at, at the top within institutions. So, yeah, I think we all have a role to play. I, I see that this work is in my own interest as well. Hmm. But also, I, I might bring different perspectives than um, a person of color to my role and, and wanting to be aware of that and try to operate well with that, you know, with the blind spots that I have. So I want to thank you for being on, for taking the time for being on. I want to thank you for talking about power. I see power as positive, and we can get power by coming together with community, by forming community land trusts and limited equity housing co-ops and worker co-ops where we come together, work together, and work with the politicians to get the tax dollars that we need to increase our communities. Thank you for the work you do. Thank you, Minnie. Vernon, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. And I have to shout out Douglas CLT in your very own Washington, D.C. Thank, thank you, you, everybody. Uh, we'll see you next Thursday. Please live cooperatively. This is WOL News Talk 1450 AM and 95.9. He was in my ear saying we...